everything that happens to a person, the way we understand ourselves and other people around, is the result of our brain activity. Everything that brain produces, its psychic and intellectual production, has strict borders and can be perceived with either our senses or our imagination. Knowing edges and specifics of intellectual product, it is possible to predict with high level of accuracy its destiny while it's being perceived, its immersion into society. We invite you to participate in a social experiment. Each person can be happy, because everyone has their own happiness, and everyone deserves it. Everything that happened with the civilization of Homo sapiens was made with hands and ideas of people. Empires rose and collapsed. Pyramids were built by different civilizations, but with the same rules and with the same result. Money were appearing, despite times and territories. This was happening before, and it happens now. We can see it on the example of Bitcoin. Why did all nations have money? Why do all nations have a cult of power? It doesn't matter if physical or intellectual. Why is incarceration is an ordeal for any person? Why does the fall always follows the rise of any state? Everything that human makes is the result of his planning and actions. All ideas are just sets of standard, well-known and understandable processes in different brains of different individuals. To understand meanings and patterns of events is to get the key to understanding the present and the future. Come take our keys and you will see new edges of reality. A human's brain is practically a set of different specialized parts which we inherited from our ancestors. Just like human embryo mutates in its mother's body, when it goes through stages of fish, amphibian, reptile, brain goes inside of mother's body through the same stages specific to our evolution. It has its ancient structures, a stem, midbrain, which are common for all animals. It has some relatively new structures, advanced limbic system and subcortical center. They regulate fear, reinforced behavior, which is the foundation for learning and training. But it has something that distinguishes us from other mammals. New cortex with an overdeveloped network of neurons of different specialization and complicated architecture. It is remarkable that in ancient parts of human brain there is insect-specific neurotransmitter acetylcholine. There is neurotransmitter natural for fish and reptiles. Adrenaline, noradrenaline, glutamate. There are also neurotransmitters that are common to our relatives, mammals. Dopamine serotonin, GABA, opiates, cannabinols. With all of that, all of these different systems are built on the foundations of specialized cells, so-called classic neurons, which have dozens of varieties and subspecies. They drastically differ from one another in their structure and purpose. Besides, Apart from classical neurons, we also emphasize helper cells. They are called neuroglia cells. They provide working, supplying, inhibition, interaction, immune protection for neurons. This complicated system reminds me of some sort of corporation, which has its analytical center and has its inner logistic service without which the corporation cannot exist. It provides communication, food, sustaining of microclimate, energy supply, and even physical security. 
It is remarkable that all these different neurons are connected with the functional system, which in total creates a single system, known as the human brain. It is funny that all this complicity has a tried final goal – energy consumption and its transformation into ideas and actions, conquering of social domination and childbearing. How do you think? Isn't it a strange evolutionary goal for this remarkable well-organized system? And even more ironical that in the roots of brain activity of this mastermind organizer there is even more primitive mechanism. Polarization and repolarization of cellular membrane plus and minus so-called neural spike trivial plus and minus in each one's head. Through impulses neurons communicate with each other. The language of communication between neurons is very diverse and individual for every single living being. If neurons of one person want to talk to the neurons of another person, they will fail. Because the process of learning of internal electrochemical language is happening under specific conditions of forming and growing of specific brain. Spike is a variant of phase transition between two different states, like changing water to steam, like melting ice into water, like an explosion as a result of destruction of chemical bonds in explosives, like the appearance of personal computer in mathematical calculus. Phase transition is always energy dependent, happens repeatedly and able to change its intensity. Neurons generate spike of different power and as a result they develop signal system, in which, for example, null is silence and one is excitation. It is believed that this way neurons have a dialogue using binary code. Based on such a system, many artificial neuron networks are being built. But there are significant disadvantages inherent in modern neural networks. There are some facts which are being ignored. For example, all incoming signals, so-called weights, are being simply summed, despite that every dendrite and synapse of a living neuron can receive unique information, or sometimes neurons' synthetic function, which is natural to every living cell, is being ignored. Or, sometimes contacts between neurons of different level, which always occur in living neural systems, are being disregarded intentionally. Cybernetics, in my opinion, miss a lot due to lack of understanding of specifics of living tissue's work, and because of ignoring details in its association with other parts. For example, manually setting up the intensity of incoming signal, an engineer eliminates the uncertainty factor as the element of quantum scale in the work of neural network. A human is an omnivore being, which is able to utilize any form of living matter, which has its start in the food chain, founding on the energy of the sun. Under variable, extreme conditions, for significant periods of time, we can consume carbohydrates and proteins of cereals and fruits and living flesh of almost any living being, from an ant to an ape. And we are not talking about gastronomic priorities. If life forces us, humans can become meat eaters or vegans in two or three generations. The idea is simple – to survive to change the habitat, to create a society that can successfully accumulate resources and reproduce itself, expanding the area of its presence. And despite all of that, for all its tangible history, humanity couldn't even imagine, until up to 19th century, that it's living under uniformed for all living law of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is a branch of physics which studies the most common properties of microscopic systems. And human is one of those systems. Ways of transporting, turnover and transformation of energy in such systems are also true for the stars, such as the sun, seas with their inhabitants, forests with their covered life and even mountains 
which are, just as everything around us, consist of elementary particles. Any sort of matter goes through its individual cycle of creation, high peak of intensity, and then decay. In accordance with modern ideas in thermodynamics, a human is an open, unstable, dynamic, self-regulating system. A human is like an equilibrist when performing while balancing on cylinders. In this metaphor, there is a balance between motion, stability and destruction, an internal balance between inner and outer worlds, between simplicity and complexity of a system. I propose to know it, to remember about it, to all subjects with testosterone model of behavior, because all of them, like all other living beings, are just like an egg. If you pierce it with a botkin or with a bullet, all its living energy will leave it under the influence of entropy and it will become a simple, non-organical ash. I personally think this perspective is silly and poor, both from the point of view of common sense and from the point of view of the public good. And maybe that is why there is no sense in inflating because of personal power, just like the narcissistic frog. Maybe it's better to do good and eternal. And maybe that is why in all the religions, which always have some rational, tangible foundation. All tyrants and bloodsuckers always come to an end. For example, in the form of termination of their line of succession. Many people may object to me. But then just look for where and how all their descendants ended their lives. Long grins, the mill of the gods. Any experimenter which works with biological objects, as with material for scientific research, knows that among all living beings, no matter what species, like yeast cells or higher primates, there is always some sort of an exception to the rule. And human is not an exception. There are always some different individuals out of the general standard. It was the same with me and my works. When hundreds of white mice were sacrificed for fundamental science, even though they all were a progeny of a single genetic line, and they all had common parents, even if they were held under absolutely identical conditions, there are always instances with strange, extreme variants of organization and objective parameters of histology biochemistry, immune system, response to stress and with different learnability. Have you ever seen identical twins? Have you noticed that even they have some differences between each other? For example, in papillary finger pattern. That means that in big human populations, in big samples, the effect of big numbers always occurs. Therefore, in fact, there is no such a thing as 100% norm. There is always an exception to the rule. There are always differences, sometimes paradoxical and unexpected. For example, calculator people or wonderkind musicians. Or the opposite. Regular, common children from genius parents. These varieties in reactions to stimul, variabilities of properties of the living flesh within one species, creates the material for revolutionary selection, which is here and now, with me and you, plays its hidden but unidirectional game. The ending sum of the game is the survival of the species in form of you, giving it more and more new qualities, which allow it to continue its expansion, acquisition of more profitable energy sources, with the goal of limitless reproduction, and improving. Therefore, there are no universal and unambiguous solutions applicable to society. There are always extreme variants, white crows, 
giving the species evolutionary advantages. But the mass of individuals in total, for about 80%, is always homogeneous. It obeys statistical laws. It organizes itself in complex vertical and horizontal chains, just like any other living system. And that is why I want to remind the champions of morality, lovers of religious laws and uniformity, that not by you, but by renegades and hermits, the public good and knowledge grows. It is at their expense that you acquire what you have. To them you should be grateful for your electromobiles, golden iPhones and ocean yachts. How do galaxies appear out of stardust? How complexly organized molecules appear from protein broth under the influence of electrical discharges? How protein life forms appear on Earth like planets? How cleanser eyes, communities of people living in common climatic or geographical conditions? How do they get overlords and laws? How outcasts appear within such communities? In whose name, years later, other charismatics subdue the so called savages? And so on and so on and repeatedly up to the formation of the United Nations. And wars for the infinite real truth, which of course doesn't exist, but there is an eternal struggle of blunt and pointed. Initial chaos, which is always some kind of reference point, serves as a material, a building block of more complex organizations and systems. The latter go through inevitable, every now and again living cycle of random connections and structurizations, specializations, dependent on running scheduled or random tasks. Accumulation of skills, competences, goods in one side, and on the other waste products, mistakes, environment change of habitat area, and after that any self-organizing system inevitably becomes sick with satiety, overcomplicating relationships and deficit of resources. It starts to reject the same rules which laid in the foundation of its rapid progress. The witch hunt starts, search for the white crows and enemies. The more dynamically expressive system is, the more it makes contribution into the changing of traditional forms adopted in the archaic version. The more inevitably and faster it comes to a period of degradation and chaos. As the great people say, from the top all the roads only lead downhill. The steeper the peak is, the faster will stones roll. In fact, there is nothing new. Everything happened and many times will happen, because in the foundation there is a banal dialectics, from the chaos to the simple, from the simple to the complicated, from the complicated to the chaos. I have no doubt that you have seen the photos of fjords, or river deltas from the space. Crowns, tree leaves, peacock tail, aren't they beautiful? And I think that you know, that in the foundation of these examples there is a strict mathematical formula, which characterizes this harmony. I'm not sure about you, but for me it's tremendous. To realize that these harmonical, beautiful objects are being made, let's say, by themselves. Some will call it the trait of God, or harmony, or a great symmetry, it doesn't matter how to call it. It is important how to understand and use it. And if you use the harmonies formula with a sense, you can get absolutely realistic visual objects like ocean waves, mountains, dunes, deserts, forest tops, crowds of digital people in games and movies. And if you look into the fractals, behavior and motion, onto how they are able to reproduce themselves and their kind, through scaling. You get the illusion of magic, almost like life, 
and it is not a coincidence. By these laws, molecules live and organize themselves, including the molecule of DNA. By these laws, protein, cellular, molecular machines operate. Rudiments arise, organs and systems of living beings develop. The macro and maybe micro architecture of the human brain develops. It is difficult to resist the temptation to use this phenomenon to explain self-reproduction, development, structurization, scaling of the living matter, and social systems, when numerous examples of the connection between the micro and macro worlds are known to us. Wherever you look, you will see some solid patterns, like the movement of elementary particles in space, so-called Levy movement is similar to the movement of hunters gatherers on the feeding territory. The movement of a hungry shark is similar to the supermarket customer. The movement of the starch molecules in water, which is a Brownian motion, is similar to the picture of game in English soccer. The directions of evolution in aircraft engineering in the 20th century and the alleged evolution of birds over millions of years are very close. The behavior of flu virus, which in the beginning attacks immune cells and only later attacks capillary epithelium of lungs and brain and other vital organs, is a complete analogy of the behavior of virus program in computer which at first block archives of antivirus, and only then starts to reproduce itself in the corrupted software. And all the heads of totalitarian regimes and religious groups are acting in the same way, just like the virus. When they first destroy independent information sources, and only then start the pseudo-reforms. And what about the evolution of string boat instruments? Where the transfer of skill from teacher to student is similar to the horizontal transmission of hereditary genes, and the appearance of new forms of instruments is similar to the appearance of random mutations. Just in the same way, like the loudest male bird is always being seen and noticed by more females and an energetic blogger who bombards the audience with a huge number of sometimes controversial facts is always marked with a large number of likes. And in the same way, just like bacterial cells, in particular e coil, find and fix DNA damage with the help of specialized enzymes, as if it was a group of IT engineers, finds and localizes the problematic server cluster in the IT company. Just like the adaptation to the new habitat of young yeast in sugar syrup, when at first all variants of genetic mutations are used, and as they are exhausted due to their inefficiency, random and characteristic forms of genetic aberrations become the main options for adoption. It reminds me personally of a group of drivers solving problems with a new type of car. When at first personal opinions and operating experience of previous cars are used. But when this problem-solving model fails, they invite engineers from the nearest university. Just like some bacteria, in particular cholera vibrios, use the experience of previously killed bacteria from which they borrow genetic material to kill neighboring cells. Just like a disguise sniper uses the methods of disguise, shooting and weapons from the professionals he hit. And this list of analogies can be continued for eternity. And I'm sure that you have pretty much of your own. Having described the phenomenon of fractals that characterize the connection between the micro and macro worlds, it is appropriate to ask the question. If thinking, consciousness, is characteristic of the brain of a person and a number of animals, why can this phenomenon occur at the level of a microorganization of a neuron? Well, or a cortical column. Why not really? 
If the answer to the question lies only in the plane of misunderstanding, then this is not an obstacle. The obstacle is always illusions, and knowledge is primary. Just look at it. In a neuron, as in any cell, there is a library of knowledge and experience, accumulated by ancestors. There are molecular machines that read and transmit this information from libraries to the cellular space for a later using. There are enzymes and systems which fix and repair the data libraries when they are damaged, with, for example, ionizing radiation. There is a group of molecular machines which is specialized in writing into DNA of the new information and experience. There are molecules acting as a message from the center as a guide to action for the periphery. There are molecules that carry chemical energy to places of its use. There are energy generators and its accumulators. There are factories which produce molecular machines and utilize molecular garbage. There are gatekeepers and guards returning metal ions glucose and external information molecules from the outside into the cell. These listings can be continued indefinitely. There are so many of them, and they capture the imagination so much. For me, the picture of the organization of the life of a single cell of a neuron, and even more so of a cortical column, is the life of a separate state with its own hierarchy, freedoms, accumulation of information about the processes occurring inside the cell, its reaction to surrounding stimuli, creation of new tools and rules for self-regulation, communication with neighbors, exploitation of flows providing energy and plastic materials, and also molecular building and repair organelles security service and selection. This is actually a separate microcosm, with the same rational, clear, verified, mathematical rules. Plunging into it, you will not only be surprised, you will no longer understand why no one is still looking for the consciousness of a single neuron. With the organization of the structure and work of a neuron described above, let's pay attention to the division of brain cells, neurons, glia, into various competencies and the tasks they solve. Some of them act as supply and security elements. Others participate as spike signal switches between them. Others reserve and discard so-called signal mediators, regulatory peptides who, like special communications carriers, endowed with unlimited rights, launch processes that are unambiguous for them. Other cell types are involved as auxiliary crisis-inhibiting managers. Others extend fantastically long communication channels, as if they were fiber-optic cables between continents. The following cells are like musicians, who meet during the performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and after its completion, they act as analysis, processing information from the exchange where lots of wheat or gas are traded. Other neurons mirror and translate information received from external observation posts into the language of the spike dialogue. For example, visual neurons. In other words, there are a lot of different specializations different types and purposes of cells, banal from the point of view of a histologist. But without their existence, the model of the brain does not add up. It just doesn't stand up to logical reasoning. And if we go higher, to the level of the cortical column, that functional unit of the brain, we suddenly see a hierarchy, almost a social pyramid among neurons. As you can see, we again observe a direct connection, an analogy with the microcosm in which a person lives as the bearer of these skills and competences. So why do we reject the very possibility of independent thinking by specialized neurons 
in relation to their environment. Why do we ignore the possibility? I do not understand. We formulated earlier a model of the organization of thinking in local neurons. We saw that neurons form an almost social structure within the cortical column and took it as a kind of a basic version. We clarified that the model exists at the micro level in certain types of neurons. At the next level of complexity we declared their associations, which in their maxim give unique properties to the human brain. Based on this logical model of organization, of thinking, it is possible to suggest one more semantic branch between the micro and macro systems of organization of thinking. If the functional specialization of individual cells is based on their morphological structure, as modern knowledge says, then why can they create heterogeneous mixed associations during the execution of specific tasks, which include all types of cells. They are called cogis, which then, after the task is completed, practically disappear. Why, the more often this temporary cognity arises, the faster it is replaced, under basic conditions, by a stable organic structuring, represented by an increase in the number of synapses the appearance of new additional axons and the growth of capillaries to them, to these communities of cells, fitting these associations with energy. For me, personally, the relationship between the microorganization of thinking as a form of social life of neurons and examples from the organization of human systems is understandable and logical. This relationship is tangible and rationally explains the phenomenon of the relationship between the forces of production and relations of production, both at the micro and macro levels. It is clear to me that the higher the intensity, the density of relationships between neurons, the higher the energy potential of their interaction, the higher the quality structuring the importance of the product, which creates a functional cognitive in the interests of the macroorganism. It's like the Manhattan Project of 1944, like the CERN collaboration for humanity in the 2000s. What is this if not the actual connection between the forces of production and the relations of production? What can be the products of a competitive opinion, and even more, of the subsequent objective action, if comfortable conditions are not created for it, for the members of this functional group? After all, a proud eagle cannot eat oatmeal, and the competitive way of thinking, or an act, will never be created by the brain of a child who has been deprived of quality food and informational environment. And here comes a simple dilemma. Either we accept the idea of neurospecificity of the substrate of thinking, in which not only the neurons themselves are extremely important, but also their environment, or we are trying to learn the meaning of life from a hungry, frozen philosopher-thinker. After all, each level of new competence and intelligence capabilities originates from the previous level. Only after meeting all its needs, the new level actually stands on the foundation of the old one and reproduces its actual fractal structure. Or we begin to consider a direct working relationship between the association of cells involved in the functional cognitive, where each neuron performs several competencies simultaneously, if you like, without infringing on its physiological rights and freedoms. Or it is necessary to stop any search for an answer to the question of what is the substratum of intelligence and where is its localization in the human brain. Before moving on to the next block of important information, I would like to dwell on the key issue 
that characterizes the life of living beings. We are talking about the presence of cycles replacing each other, characteristic of animate and inanimate nature, for man as a part of it. It is cycles, their presence that I consider as the basis of self-organization of systems in which a person lives. I don't dwell on banal things like the seasons, the phases of the moon, the magnetic activity of the sun. There are other opinions on these issues that I respect. It is important for me to note the connection between micro and macro systems in this matter. If, on the one hand, we take the maximum values, for example, the life cycle of a star, and on the other hand, the microcycle underlying the belusov jibotinsky chemical reaction or the spike cycles of a neuron, we will see that in the interval between these two points we can place all the cycles known to us that are interesting from the point of view of the ultimate goal of this narrative. For example, the cell division cycle, the organ cycle, the wake-sleep circadian rhythm, the reproductive cycle, the life cycle of a species, the shift in behavior preferences, and even the life cycle of a brand name. After all, all of them, biological and population and social cycles, are based on mathematical constants and patterns and are well described in the language of mathematics. It was the mathematical language that showed the peculiarity of these cycles, which tend to exist in at least two planes. As, for example, there is a cycle of rotation of the Earth around the Sun, where the tilted axis forms the period of the year. Or how the movement of the Foucault pendulum first showed the transformation of the banal cycle of the pendulum, back and forth, into a kind of a figure 8. And no matter what explains this phenomena, for example, gravity, the important thing is that they are inevitable for a man, as they affect his existence while he lives within the solar system. It should be noted that any cycle, as mentioned earlier, has a non-linear value and a lot of deviations, like any multifactorial system. So it turns out that from the Foucault pendulum to the laws that describe the movement of capital in the global economy, the path of logic is multi-stage and multi-dimensional. The connection between start and finish, between action and result, is obvious. Any event, even in a vacuum, has its consequences. Any action and result lead either to the accumulation, structuring of matter and energy, or to its dispersion. The point is only in the interval of observation, in the location of the observer. For example, you cannot see how mountains crumble into sand, just because our lifespan is very short. But you can see how a piece of sugar dissolves in a glass of hot tea, and how this process is accelerated by stirring with a spoon. Ivan Petrovich Pavlov is still a diamond in a rare galaxy of Nobel laureates from the Russian scientific school. In his report in Madrid, he was the first to formulate the principles of the physiology of higher nervous activity. He was the first to introduce the concepts of skill reinforcement, and conditional and conditioned reflexes, excitation and inhibition of nervous activity, irradiation and concentration of nervous excitement. Pavlov formulated his vision of the processes occurring in the nervous system. And the types that he identified are surprisingly similar with the classification of temperament, according to Hippocrates from the Asclepiad family. Here is his classification. Weak type, characterized by weakness in both excitation and inhibition, which corresponds to the Hippocratic melancholic. A strong and balanced type, characterized by strong excitation and weak inhibition, corresponds to the choleric, unrestrained type according to Hippocrates. Strong, balanced, mobile type, 
corresponds to the sanguine, lively type. Strong, balanced, but with slow nervous processes. Corresponds to so-called phlegmatic, calm type. Let us now try to do the following. Since the essence of the processes of excitation and inhibition, concentration and irradiation has the character of antagonism, and they are based on the process of energy consumption, together with the fact that irradiation can proceed simultaneously with excitation, let's try to describe these processes as a simple system of mutually intersecting axes. X and Y. This is what we get. The system depends on the personal abilities of the subject, from what he is more inclined from birth, to strong nervous excitement or to a steady concentration of excitement. The ability to concentrate or to excitement are not chosen, they are determined by genetics and come to us from our parents. Consequently, the Pavlovian so-called strong inhibition in a choleric person corresponds to a rapid depletion of the functional system of concentration in the source of excitation. This leads to a generalization of excitation, which is characteristic of the choleric. Subjects with a strong, balanced Pavlovian type are prone to the formation of time-stable functional systems which are expressed in the ability to long-term concentration of thought processes, which includes ability to focus attention and concentrate. Of course, the human psyche is plastic, and some mental techniques can allow you to work on improving your mental status. But it is worth remembering that a hippo will never become a flamingo, no matter how he tries to paint himself with pink paint. It should also be noted that in our coordinate system there is no so-called phase zero, as well as an absolute one. There are peak values of maximum and minimum, and there is a phase transition from one state to another. It is strange that taking a binary system as a basis, trying to build an artificial intelligence based on neural networks, using the example of Zhikevich, most cybernetics forget about the existence of a spatial parallel architecture in the system of radiation and concentration. This is when one task is performed not by one specialized, but by several neural networks that are reconfigured on the go. It's interesting that no one rebuilds them, they sort of rebuild their profiles themselves. It's like if you are a mother this morning, and in the afternoon you are an employee of a corporation. In the evening you plan the organization's budget, and in the morning you are already a lecturer at the university. They also forget about inertia in the system, and about the presence of a phase transition between the states of 1 and 0. It may not be necessary to create a quantum computer to create a semblance of artificial intelligence, and maybe we should pay more attention to the inextricable link between excitation and irradiation. We could also introduce the concept of a third magnitude, like yes, maybe, not. As it was once practiced by the Soviet school of cybernetics. What's primary? Forehead or rake? Thoughts about the eternal, or stars that give us food for thinking. Different concepts, but the essence is the same, since the result and the cause always have one reference point, the human mind. Let's see what Immanuel Kant thought about it. To understand the principle of Kant's critical philosophizing, it is necessary to conduct a thought experiment. We use the Rorschach test. The subject is shown in ink blots and asked to say what he sees in these pictures. The result is a verbal projection of the subject's thoughts in real time. In the same inkblot, people may see completely different images that reflect their inner and emotional world. The layman will say, so what? But Kant 
after a series of reflections formulated a thesis. The human mind imposes its own patterns on nature and the world. In other words, only the phenomena that make up the content of our personal experience are available to our consciousness. And the accessible world is only known in its actual forms that we can touch it with our hands. In other words, we are not given a chance to understand the essence of things and events until we expand the horizon of our knowledge and get at our disposal a tool for mastering it. Pay attention! Kant lived in 18th century. But the questions that he formulated are relevant for the most of us today. In the theory of knowledge, Immanuel Kant singled out categories. Quantity or amount. The higher the amount of information that we own, the higher the accuracy of knowledge. Quality. The more intense the immersion in the unknown, the wider the horizons of the questions that we ask ourselves. Attitude. During the construction of dual intellectual structures, our knowledge is used selectively, something we see and something not. Modality. Tonality. Sensory perception of a priori ideas about the essence of phenomena determines the intensity, judgment and productivity of the hypotheses that we put forward. A contradiction, the so-called dialectic according to Kant, is a necessary element of knowledge. Contradiction is always relative, since there is a collision, a position, not of the things themselves, but only of mental activity. So it is not the actual knowledge itself that is opposed, but only the forms of knowledge. Imagine that two people are participating in a dispute, each of which refers to the results of their own laboratory, in which they use their own systems of measures and weights. The result of such a dispute is clearly fruitless, but without a doubt, the vector of reflection will be present, and perhaps even allow them to come to some general conclusions. Let's see what Carl Gustav Jung thought about people and how Carl Gustav Jung classified their types. He is considered to be the founder of modern psychoanalysis, which has been successfully used by hundreds of psychoanalysts. He believed that people can be conditionally divided into two groups, according to the principle of social orientation. The first is extroverts, they want social inclusion. And the second is introverts, they avoid contacts with the surrounding public and prefer to live in their own illusory world. He also conditionally divided people into four groups. The former gravitate toward a deep assimilation of new information. The second succumb to impulses and perform actions guided by feelings and sensations. The third group is prone to getting new or repeating old pleasant emotions. And the fourth believes that their actions are based on fatalism, intuition, and sincerely trust all kinds of esoteric teachings and spiritual practices. The mental matrix of Carl Jung, according to its idea and functions, lies like a key in a lock on the physiological constants described by Pavlov. Let's use the four-factor personality concept of Hans Jürgens Eisenk in which he divides the personality into certain elements, which are arranged in a hierarchical order. Eisenk believed that each person has a complex of innate and acquired character traits, or personality type, which have a powerful influence on the human behavior. These basic features are the wind that blows in the sails of the boat, the personality of a person in which direction the wind blows, the boat goes there. A person can set different sails, 
can change the course of a boat, but a person cannot change the prevailing wind rolls. It is noteworthy that this statement is echoed by another concept of the hierarchy of needs by Maslow, which, despite the controversy of higher values, postulates the well-known thesis an empty belly can't learn. That is, if you are hungry, thirsty, then you are not able to perceive any thoughts or theories that do not lead to the satisfaction of basic physiological needs. By the way, how long ago did you eat? It is interesting that Isaac was one of the first psychologists who, based on factual and not mental material, like expert assessments, analysis of biographical information, physiological and physical parameters, as well as objective psychological tests, using statistical models, like factorial analysis, found a tool for actual calculation and analysis of the structural elements of the personality. In other words, he proposed a convenient ruler for the personality, an anemometer to measure the speed of the rows of winds that move our boat through life. As a result, Isaac identified two basic personality types, which he called introversion, extroversion and neuroticism stability. These two dimensions of personality type are independent of each other. Accordingly, using two dimensions, all humanity can be conditionally divided into four groups. Introvert stable, calm, balanced, reliable, controlled, peaceful, attentive, caring, passive. Introvert neurotic, prone to mood swings, anxious, rigid, reasonable, pessimistic, withdrawn, quiet. Extrovert stable, leader, carefree, cheerful, flexible, sympathetic, talkative, friendly and sociable. Extrovert neurotic, vulnerable, restless, aggressive, excitable, fickle, impulsive, optimistic and active. It should be noted that Ising gave particular importance to individual differences. And thus, no combination of these personality types can be preferred as superior. It doesn't exist in the nature. There are no good or bad combinations. The carefree and sociable type of behavior has both pros and cons. The same can be said about the quiet, withdrawn demeanor. It is important to understand that there are no bad trees in the forest, there are no bad types of personality. We are all just different. Now let's look at the projective mythology for studying personality from Max Lucher, the so-called eight-color test. In his opinion, the perception of color is objective and universal. Color preferences allow us to measure the subjective state of a human using a color test. When applying the short version, a set of eight colors is used. Gray, dark blue, blue-green, red-yellow, yellow-red, red-blue, or purple-brown and black. The test allows us to conduct a surface analysis of personality, based on information obtained from a simple ranking of colors. The subject is asked to disregard the associations, connected with fashion, traditions, generally accepted tastes, and try to choose colors only on the basis of his personal attitude. Since the choice of color is based on unconscious processes, it indicates what a person really is and not on what he imagines himself to be, or what he would like to be. In fact, the test is adding to the Ising personality questionnaire and complements it. Now I propose to look at the four-quadrant behavioral model DISC to study the behavior of people in their environment or in particular situation. It examines behavioral styles 
and behavioral preferences. DISC is a group of psychological descriptions developed by John Geyer and based on the work of the psychologist William Martson. When evaluating human behavior, four aspects are distinguished that speak about a person's preferences in word associations. D. Dominant. A characteristic of the ability to lead, self-affirmation, leadership. Type D people are described as demanding, acting, driven, ambitious, aggressive. I. Influence. People with high I influence others through conversations and actions and can be emotional. They are described by the following words persuasive, warm, demonstrative, optimistic. S. Steady. People with a high S are calm, gentle, patient, predictable, deliberate, consistent. C. Conscientious. They mostly follow the rules and regulations and can be described in words systematizing, neat, diplomatic, precise. This quadruple lies on the vector grid of concentration, irradiation, inhibition, excitation, easy and beautiful. Do you see any patterns? Further will be more interesting. Now I suggest us to look at the motivational structure of the human psyche from the author of the bestseller Neuromarketing Triangle. He believes that the motivational structure of the personality is genetically determined. It is our ancestral heritage in the form of vital needs and functions. In the process of growing up and gaining life experience, cultural influence, education, subjective experience, each person acquires its own individuality. The results of the studies of the triangle group show that individuals or groups of people differ markedly from each other in their motivational structure. For example, there is a type of people, a group of people, with a pronounced sociality. Such people are prone to strong manifestations of empathy and affection. A relatively small group of people preach the values inherent in the alpha motif, like, for example, the desire for power, dominance, everywhere and always, ignoring of opinions of others. Dominant individuals have significantly higher level of testosterone and serotonin in their blood than non-dominant individuals. There is also a group of people for whom safety comes first. Speaking about the motive of innovation, it should be noted that it is inherent in people with natural curiosity, with a characteristic thirst for knowledge and joy from it. By the way, this is my psychotype. It turns out that the motivation structure model combines four main categories. Security, health, religion, traditions, sociality, family, reverence, holidays, success, victory, will, strength, prestige, and innovation, truth, knowledge, desire for change and innovation. It is noteworthy that the categories are easily built into a two-vector model of concentration, irradiation, excitation, inhibition. Even when exposed to the same stimuli, a person perceives information selectively, depending on the individual type of emotional system. What is the greatest pleasure for an adventurer can be very unpleasant for a person who puts safety above all else. The alpha-oriented person experiences great joy from defeating the enemy, while the socially-oriented person suffers along with the defeated one. The specificity of the motivational structure of the human psyche determines how the emotional system reacts to stimuli from the outside world. What kind of motivation prevails in a person 
greatly affects his perception and emotional assessment of the world around him. Let's move on. Let's look at BCG Matrix, which is used as a tool for strategic analysis and planning in marketing. It is used to analyze the success of a company based on its position in the market and also on its product, on what is the demand for this product and which part does it take on the market. The theoretical justification is based on two concepts. The life cycle of a product, the effect of scale of production or the learning curve. The market share is laying along the x-axis and y-axis represents the growth in demand. The combination of estimates of these two indicators makes it possible to classify the product, highlighting four possible roles of the product for the company that produces or sells it. Let's look at the characteristics of these four categories. Stars – high sales growth and high market share. Stars give a lot of income, but despite the attractiveness of this product, its net cash flow is quite low, as it requires significant investment to ensure a high growth rate. Cash cows – high market share, but low sales growth. Cash cows must be protected and controlled as much as possible. Wildcats – low market share, but high growth. They need to be studied. In the future they can become both stars and dogs. Dogs – the growth rate is low, the market share is low, the product, as a rule, has a low level of profitability and requires a lot of attention. And now let's use the following marketing tool. The FCB matrix. The matrix shows the relationship between the degree of consumer involvement, the method of cognition of reality and consumer reaction models. The intellectual method of cognition is based on the mind, logic, reasoning, factual information while the emotional method is non-verbal and is based on emotions, intuition, feelings, experiences. These two approaches to reality are not always distinct, but often complement each other. For some types of goods, one of the methods mentioned may dominate over another one. The simultaneous consideration of the degree of involvement and the method of cognition leads to the matrix of involvement in which four models of human reaction can be distinguished. The learning model describes buying situations where the involvement is high and the learning method is intelligent. This situation corresponds to the sequence of reactions – know, feel, do. This sequence is followed when purchasing high-value goods, such as cars, insurance policies, yachts. The emotion model describes buying situations where the involvement is just as great, but emotionality prevails in the cognition of reality. In this case, the realized sequence of reactions is feel, learn, do, or feel, do, learn. This category includes cosmetics, clothing, jewelry, fashion items, the so-called good symbols. In the habitat model engagement is low. Here we can find routine products with minimal involvement, which leaves the consumer indifferent because they perform the basic function expected of them. The sequence of reactions is do, learn, feel. This category includes goods with a simple or banal function – electric batteries, paper products, detergents, matches, etc. In the model of hedonism, low involvement is combined with the sensory method of cognition. Here are the goods that deliver little joys. 
and for which the hedonic component is important. Typical representatives of such goods are beer, chocolate, alcohol, cigarettes, sweets. Let's digress from the theory and look at the practice. We use the priority matrix of Duart Eisenhower. The matrix helps us to identify the most important and urgent matters in project management or in daily life. The uniqueness of this technique is that a person learns to realize what is the most important and what can be discarded altogether, because sometimes the importance or unimportance of some things cannot be that obvious. The system is so simple that it is almost intuitive. It is practically easy to master it. Important and urgent. These are jobs that need to be done right now. Neutralization of the crisis, urgent tasks that can quickly lead to high costs and problems. Important but not urgent. This is useful, valuable work, which should be given most of the time. These tasks are steps, elements of important strategies and plans. Failure in accomplishing them will have far-reaching consequences. Not important, urgent. This is work, tasks, that can be entrusted to other performers. These tasks do not require high competence. Not important, not urgent. These are tasks that can be abandoned without any loss or cost. Let us now touch on a very controversial but interesting aspect, which Charles Louis Montesquieu considered in the 18th century in his work on the spirit of the law. He believed that from the difference in needs generated by the difference in climates comes the difference in the way of life, and from the difference in the way of life the difference in laws. In this way Montesquieu directly linked climate with the form of organization of society. I think that viewers under the age of 18 will be able to personally see this at the end of their lives in the 21st century, when they will witness global climate change and tectonic changes in the ethic and social map of the world. Probably the authors of now forgotten book Features of National Psychology, Alexeyev and Krylov, were also interested in Montesquieu's ideas. The authors distinguish four ethnocultural types – Southern, Eastern, Western, Northern – which differ in ethically acceptable reactions of a person to the actions of others. In their opinion, most of the inhabitants of the Earth belong to the first three types of ethical systems. The authors illustrate their statements with such illustrations. The Southern type of ethics is guided by the law of Moses. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The Eastern type lives according to the dictum of Confucius. Do not do to another what you do not wish for yourself. Western ethics is illustrated by Montesquieu's aphorism. Freedom is the right to do everything that the law does not forbid. Northern ethics, including Russians, follows the proverb Do not leave as you want but leave as God commands. Remember the rigid puritanical views of the Protestants of Europe in 16th-19th centuries, and the meaning of these words will become clear. All these are types of complex ethics of behavior ennobled by modern civilization. Complex ethics, according to the authors of the work, developed from simple ethics, which is by no means attractive to me. Southern simple ethics makes you follow the actions of others without hesitation, turning people into a crowd. Eastern ethics makes a person ignore even a benefactor, even everyone ignores him. Western ethics oblige to do what the boss does, regardless of the nature of the actions. The Northern forbids doing anything that the community does not like. Thus, in simple ethics, the repetition of the actions of others becomes a duty for everyone, while aliens are outside of any ethical standards. Despite all the simplicity and simultaneous complexity of this concept, it easy finds a lot of examples from the everyday and professional lives of listeners. 
you will find a lot of your own illustrations for the words above. Let's move from philosophical categories and look at the experimental data. Interesting work from Akira Nishi and Hirokazu Sherado, published in Nature magazine in 2015. In a social experiment, in a playful way, they showed that the openness of information about the wealth of partners contributes to the growth of inequality. In the closed variants of the experiment, the level of inequality stabilized at a relatively low level over 10 rounds, regardless of the initial level of inequality in the group. In the opened variants, by the 10th round the level of inequality turned out to be higher. The negative effect of openness was most pronounced in groups with initially high inequality. In groups with an average initial level of inequality, this effect was weaker. In groups with initial equality, it was barely visible and was not statistically significant. The conclusion follows from these semantic sets that the openness of information about the wealth of neighbors is damaging to experimental societies. The ostentatious inequality reduced the level of cooperation negatively affected the development of the social network and hindered the growth of general welfare. Curiously, inequality itself was not as harmful as its openness. If the players did not know anything about the wealth of the partners, then even in society with initially strong inequality, a high level of cooperation and social interrelations was maintained. The general welfare grew while inequality decreased. However, the ability to count money in the neighbor's pocket led to the fact that even in initially egalitarian society cooperation declined, social bonds did not develop and overall wealth grew more slowly. Psychological mechanisms underlying the observed tendencies remain to be elucidated. But in general, the results look plausible and logical. For example, the authors admit that the availability of information about someone else's wealth makes people perceive the situation as a competition, and the points scored as a sign of social status, which gives the rise to a fear of being the worst of all and this invites banal envy and reduces the tendency to cooperate. Gentlemen employers, do you understand the meaning? Your bragging with yachts and planes are ruining your business. They are a bone in the throat of your business. Maybe this is the rational meaning of the so-called protestant ethic? Maybe that's why the oil sultanates are so similar to each other. Does this mean that for the harmonious development of society it is necessary to fight not with inequality, but with the openness of information about it, for example with the fashion for conspicuous consumption, and then people will be more inclined to cooperate, and the distribution of goods will become more equitable over time, by itself? Can we say that in those countries in which it is not common to show the wealth, there are the best chances for favorable dynamic of social and economic development. Let's tackle another tricky question. The theme of Marxism in recent decades has again become speculative. Dozens of new preachers talk about the benefits of world socialism, about Kissel banks with milk, somehow ignoring the sad result of a social experiment in Eastern Europe in the 20th century. In the doctrine of historical materialism, man is treated not as an independent individual, but as a participant, a set of social relations. Therefore, the philosophy of Marxism is a philosophy of society that cannot be torn off from its specific historical path. So, initially, the role of the individual is reduced to zero. The individual becomes a part of a large social machine where the good of society 
is everything, and the individual is nothing. The driving force of history Marx considered to be material production, basis, which determines the superstructure. The most important fact of anthropogenesis by Marx was the transition from an appropriating economy to a producing economy. Production, by Marx, leaves a certain imprint on society. As a result, there is a number of successively replacing each other models of production, the so-called formations. Well, of course, primitive communal, slaveholding, feudal, capitalist, socialist, and finally, communist. All known formations contain contradictions between the forces of production and production relations that cannot be resolved by Marx within the framework of this historically conditioned formation and require a transition to a higher level of social development. That means a decrease in social entropy, which means an increase in the complexity of the social system. Depending on their relationship to the means of production, the members of society are divided into classes. Slave owners and slaves, feudal lords and peasants, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Those already at the very foundation of the theory are enemies and oppressed. In the course of the class struggle, the most powerful class, such as enemies, creates the state as an instrument of oppression, as well as various forms of ideology, including religion, law, art, way of life, as part of the state machine. The change of formations is determined by the level of development of productive forces, which gradually outgrow production relations and enter into antagonistic conflict with them, which leads to revolutions, social and political. The oppressed, through violent actions, change their enemies and build a more complex organization of social relations. Socialism and Communism the communist revolution, according to the representatives of Marxism, must overcome all the antagonistic contradictions of capitalism, and then finally free men from alienation, all forms of wage slavery, exploitation of men by men, and lead the society to a classless communist formation. Take a note that we again feed the existing complex social patterns into a simple two-vector coordinate system. That is, even Marxism, which is difficult from the point of view of understanding by many, becomes understandable and predictable when applying the reductionist approach. The next step in understanding reality, for me, was the concept of energy evolutionism from Michael Weller. From the point of view of Weller, the existence of the universe is considered as the evolution of the primary energy of the Big Bang, and this energy is connected into material structures, more and more complex, which then, in its turn, disintegrate with the release of energy, and these cycles go on constantly and with acceleration. The existence of a person is considered by Weller as a desire to receive the most powerful sensations, and objectively as a desire to perform maximum actions to change the environment. Since a person receives sensations through actions, these events are progressive and cyclical. In this way, humanity increasing the progress of civilization, captures free energy, and while transforming it, releases energy outward, on an increasing scale and at an increasing speed. It transforms the matter surrounding mankind and acts as a point, an instrument of the evolution of the universe. The verbal categories of morality, justice, happiness, and love are considered as psychological and social support 
for the biosystem's aspiration to perform maximum actions to transform the accessible part of the universe. The end of history is considered by Weller as the action of post-humanity to release all the energy of the matter of the universe. Thus, practically a new Big Bang, which will destroy our universe and become the birth of the new universe. This is kind of a wheel of samsara in the language of philosophy. I have no doubt that you friends will be able to supplement my force identified over the years of random observations with your artifacts. I am sure that your critical analysis will reveal defects in my conclusions, which I will be very happy about. The main thing that exists and is replicated by different people living in different historical periods is the same model of logical reasoning understanding of human actions, human communities, and social actions produced by them. The main thing is that we are all driven by our desire to expand the horizon of our knowledge, to get a tool for understanding the essence of things and events, here and now. And do you say in which connection is Kant here? So. What do we see? At one side, neurons as a micro-level of organization of anthropomorphic consciousness live in a two-vector system – excitation, inhibition, concentration, irradiation. At the other side, the external manifestations of human mental activity also fit into the four-factor model described by Hippocrates. At the third side, Social organizations, in forms of mental activity, time after time, example after example, can be subjected to stratification with the help of a four-factor matrix. At the fourth side, when analyzing the history of civilizations on different continents, throughout the history of mankind, we are able to identify and describe social-technological trends that fit into a matrix of four categories. The period of birth, expansion, reaching the maximum peak, and inevitable degradation, decay. It turns out that consistently moving from the micro to the macro level, we can, this way or another, see two main trends external energy-intensive expansion and the desire to complicate the organization, which are easily divided into four categories, groups. Thus, the first conclusion from all of the above, when assessing the world of people, social bonds and the results of their activities, all anthropogenic events and trends from the micro to the macro level can be considered as Quattroland. Each word of a person is a path of audio vibrations, generation of spike activity in the neurons of the inner ear, formation of a semantic image in the associative cortex of your brain, which is inherent only to you, only to a particular person. This is an amazing phase transition from a physical fluctuation in the air to a multifunctional, almost tangible, visible picture in the head of the listener, for example in my head. It seems funny to me, but the back to front is visual and audio hallucination, which indirectly confirms that semantic images are the fruit of a person's thought turn away from reality. By the way, have you ever noticed that when you repeat one word more than 30 times, almost always the meaning of the word is subjected to mental distortion, and moreover, the meaning of the word fades and disappears? Try saying, for example, stool 30 times. So, the mental image of a word 
its semantic content is always subjective, and in order to convey it to another person, a dialogue with interlocutors is necessary. When all participants agree on the meaning, shades of a word or expression, this is exactly what neurons do when neural connections are established in a child's head, and the cells agree on a single type of encryption. By the way, for those who are interested in this topic, I highly recommend studying the joint work of Alexei Redozubov and Sergei Medvedev. It seems to me that this is the best concept of consciousness that I have seen. Please note that each person has his own individual language of dialogue between neurons. This is why it is so hard to build some sort of an interface. This is how we understand the meaning of the words of the interlocutor, when, with the help of simpler but already understandable words and expressions, we acquire a new subjective type of knowledge about the subject of conversation that is characteristic only for us. This is exactly what engineers, doctors, mathematicians, who can talk about the same thing but in different languages, do. It turns out that we also both able and unable, it all depends on the specific case, understand or not understand the meaning of complex terms, emotions, freedom, well-being, neuroticism, and ad infinitum. It turns out that in order to understand the term, it is necessary to do intellectual work, to understand the meaning of the word, to spend the energy that is necessary to establish new contacts between neurons and write to the molecular libraries denoting the word. Only in this case, the word, term, becomes our own and is further used by us as a communication tool. Then the question becomes appropriate, if meanings, semantic patterns of words are subjective and require personal perception, how can we build pictures of the real world on their basis without distorting them? So how can you find a solution to an equation where the number of variables is always equal to the number of signs, and each listener has his own numbers and equations. The answer is no way. If the basis is not based on objective, independent, and reproducible multiple times constants. Maybe that's why psychology, which tools are totally subjective, will never be able to explain how the human brain works. Just like a religious doctrine, which will never be able to show where the center of God is. Because it is based on a subjective experience, the illusory world of a primate without a tail and encloses, and not a clear subjective system. It is precisely because of the lack of objective instrumentation and critical thinking in the group that Homo sapiens is so easily influenced by the pseudo-rational practices that soul-catchers successfully sell. It is difficult for me to resist sarcasm when the speaker begins to turn to arguments and events that have never been objectively fixed and experimentally confirmed by anyone. Here will be some examples. The so-called will of samsara, the influence of the planets, the desire of the universe, the energy of the mind, mental maps, energy circulation channels, emotional emissions and burnouts. This list can be continued indefinitely. But what about the numerous classifications and philosophical schools that entirely build their rational hypotheses on the basis of subjective and little verifiable dogmas formulated by the founder father? but in fact imposed by the carrot and the stick, as most of the sects do. Maybe that's why they don't withstand the life cycle of more than two generations and end with the death of their founder's father and his closest followers. But the trick is that they reward their flock with cheap dopamine during their practices. 
But then, I'm sorry, how do these religious doctrines differ from the yoga circle and its neophytes? Which purpose is more about using marijuana than to practically solve the problems of the seekers of truth? Which led them to the so-called guru? Turns out that nothing differs them. It turns to be that if a newfangled doctrine cannot be subjected to simple rules of verification, for example, reproducibility and measurability, model of falsification, then it's just another mind game to satisfy someone's needs, often very controversial. So, if I am talking about rational and objective knowledge, I propose to agree on generally accepted terms, used in the following. Let's turn on our imagination and conduct a thought experiment. Let's take as the basis an indivisible, imaginary fragment of matter. Let's call it conditionally quantum. An indivisible quantum can experience only two variants of existence. Either actual displacement is a result of receiving an impulse from an external force, and I have no data on the existence of absolute zero, do you? Or random structuring when interacting with other participants in the system. In the first case, we see a change in position in space. What's there, seen here. And it doesn't matter at what level we consider the system, in quantum or theoretical mechanics. In the second case, we understand that the system can either become more complex to infinity or decay to the original quantum if entropy dominates in the system. I suggest making it harder. Imagine that a movement in space, a change in the orientation of a quantum, is the minimum possible value, such as the most, the most minus, and instantaneous release, energy management, due to actions, sequential actions of a person, is the maximum possible plus. With regard to higher nervous activity, everything that is in the interval between these two values is an action associated either with the activity of a neuron, on the one hand, or with the activity of a social system a group of people, which determines the free use of energy, on the other hand. In other words, any action or inaction of a person, society, can be put in the indicated plane, the vector of will, actions, joint actions. These actions are based on the costs of energy brought from outside, due to its transformation. For example, chemical atomic bonds and, as an essence of a higher order, social relationships. It turns out there are no energy costs, there is no will, there are no actions, there is no impulse that changes the location of a quantum, a cell, a living being, a material product, born of its existence, no environmental changes. There are no complex forms of interaction between creatures, there is no sum of their influence on the environment, there is no change in it, there is no transformation of the available energy for making even more complex but energetically more profitable options for the existence of living beings as a form of matter. Thus, a definition becomes available to us, a term that I propose to use as an objective factor, the minimum, simplest level of regulation of actions, human actions. I propose to conditionally call it impetus. Everything that is in the plane of this rational concept, we will explore, structure, define belonging for subsequent thought experiments and not only to understand, but also to use for ourselves and for the other's good. For example, 
how to link the appearance of a new polymer based on cellulose and solvent to the global oil market. Well, this is how. Actions aimed at creating such a polymer in approximately five years will lead to a redistribution of the global plastics market and a significant reduction in oil consumption in the world and to a significant increase of value of shares of companies producing this solvent. This fact is well known, google it and you will find it. Or, how does the energy consuming practice of an engineer's thought experiment, whose brain is wasting glucose reserves, affect the capitalization of the space industry? I see it like this. There is a neuron spike. There is a functional dominant as the material basis of the hypothesis. Essentially, a cognito in the brain of an individual. There are efforts made to test the hypothesis in an experiment by building a working prototype. There is a successful test of the rocket's return stage. And there is a rapid increase in capitalization of a company that brings such a rocket to the space industry. Remember fractals? When similar things always and everywhere turn into similar things. When from the micro to the macro level we see the same patterns and even same forms of existence, which are described in the form of an elegant and ubiquitous formula, the Maldebrot set. Let it be rude, but it becomes obvious that it is impetus, the influence of external or hidden energy contained in chemical bonds. It is precisely the intellectual work and strength of human hands, greatly enhanced with the help of other available forms of energy, including electricity, launches a cascade of transformations of matter and the emergence of its new forms. Further, I propose to continue the thought experiment and imagine a chain of successive events, again in our head, which a separate quantum, our mental indivisible element, goes through in the system of matter complication. Consistently becoming more complex, the chain of events looks something like this. First a neuron spike, because it is it that underlines thinking. Then the neuron activates and involves a chain of neighbors from the cortical column, with which it is connected by neuronal connections. Then, for a specific task, a cognitum appears. Then, the carrier, the owner of the cognitum Homo sapiens, realizes the idea, builds a plan for its implementation and performs a series of actions. Then, the person activates social bonds between a group of friendly people, shares his motives, arguments and calls them to joint actions. Then they are seized by a common knowledge and will, and they begin to pursue a common goal for them which, in its beginning, is nothing more than a set of words and meanings. Then, involved individuals begin to accumulate knowledge with both positive and negative experience. Then, using knowledge, a group of individuals begins to accumulate structure practices and resources, including financial, energy, pursuing their common goal, the creation of new, previously non-existent methods of changing the environment of their stay, in other words, the world around them. Further, this process, with successful and favorable implementation, becomes an example for others, becomes a variant of the norm. Thus, new, hitherto, unexplored forms of existence and social relations take over society. This is how prerequisites appear for the complication of society, its division into carriers of practice and observers. This is how elements of the complication of the system, heterogeneous in essence, in the layman's language, where it is empty and where it is dense, appeared, appear and will appear. And such a system is based on the transformation of experience, knowledge into material forms of human benefits, new practices, technologies, unions of individuals, united by a common goal. We will observe the accumulation of information and skills by these unions, the creation of even more complex associations that choose different types of relationships with the outside world and human communities. 
these relationships can either act as a locomotive, move social progress, or, on the contrary, act as a tool for the degradation and destruction of previous associations. If the community chooses the option of exploiting the primitive motives inherent in primates, then leaders and chiefs appear, who, destroying everything in their path, create a new world that is correct for their thinking, where they know everything and can do everything, where they sit at the top of the social pyramid and dispose public knowledge and resources. But if the community is guided by the synthesis of personal and public good, communities arise that try to change the society for the better, share experience with neophytes, build on their basis new forms of social relations and technologies, the ultimate goal of which is the creation of a new society. But under this name, there can be completely unexpected options, from charitable organizations, the existence of which at first glance contradicts Darwinism, to new options for organizing thinking and the emergence of a global mind. There is no contradiction in my statement, because if you have new tools, practices, resources that are not characteristic of a human as a biological being, why should you give up global goals that can change the course of the history of human civilization? It's funny that if this is not done, then the end of humanity as a form of existence of protein bodies will be put either by a super volcano or another asteroid or a methane gun. So which option are you interested in? Remember the oxymoron performed by Faina Arnevskaya? Little girl, what would you like more? To be beheaded? Or to go to the country house? To the country house! You see? The country house! With regard to the products of the human brain, everything that is in the gap between the neuron spike and theory and practice of the CERN collider, with its multi-billion dollar budget and terabyte servers, is an action associated either with the synthetic activity of the neuron, on the one hand, or with the complexity of the organization of the social system, which determines free possession of knowledge and resources. In other words, any action or inaction of a person, society, can be placed in the indicated plane of actions, deeds. Since we are trying to use in our work a non-suggestive, subjective dictionary accessible to the understanding of everyone, I propose to introduce into our dictionary a term denoting these processes, social entropy or simply entropy. Let physicists be indignant, but the term describes well both the physical process and the processes of degradation of social systems, so I will not deny myself using it. It is symptomatic, but for a human and complex forms of organizations, interaction with their own kind the same patterns are characteristic as for all other representatives of living beings on Earth, ranging from corals, bees, crabs, where the brain is either absent or it is completely rudimentary, ending social systems in birds, dolphins, elephants, primates, and can be continued ad infinitum. The proposed concept is similar to a coin, where the obverse does not exist without the other side, the reverse. As there is no action, movement, useful work without the expenditure of energy, just as there is no rest, inaction without degradation and destruction of a person, complex forms of social relationships. As there is no cognitum, the action of an individual or community, without creating new or destroying old relationships between the participants in the system. When I am saying this, I remember Mozart's Requiem Confitat, and this work is also a synthesis of energy expenditure, work done with a new structure, a new sequence of notes that Mozart's brain created. So it turns out that any events 
that occur in the human brain or an individual or a human community are derived between impetus energy and entropy structure. And in this process there are no limits for novelty. Anyone who claims otherwise simply parasitizes on the point of stability that he reached earlier. Because nothing warms the soul of a primate like his own greatness. How are you? Are you still with us? Are the contours of the new reality already visible? Then I propose to transfer pure knowledge to the inhabited by a new form of matter that didn't exist before, sinful Earth. I'm talking about Homo sapiens. And here the Buddhists and skeptics will say, and maybe it existed. Then bring your arguments to the stage, which I will be happy to touch, measure and immediately become your like-minded person. Sorry, I believe in the predestination of things and the essence of events, but only when they have all the facets of true knowledge, objectivity of observation, measurability and reproducibility, and the possibility of falsification. For some viewers, I did not say anything new, because these are the criteria for scientific knowledge. But for others it is a gift, just as Occam's razor was once a gift for me. It is logical to assume that if all the derivatives of the actions in actions of the human brain can be put on a rational justification, in fact a grid of coordinates, therefore using a new algorithm for understanding the world, we can translate all and everything that exists in a world of people into a system of numbers and mathematical patterns. The head explodes, but it's not just possible, it should definitely be done. And even if my knowledge looks strange at first glance, it should be tested in practice, filled with mathematical logic, because this is the only objective method of understanding reality available to a person. Allow me a digression here. A number of physiologists, thinkers, discussing the intellect, ask a critical question, as Descartes' students asked him. If I think, if I exist, then my thought is only the essence of my inner world, then my mathematical formula is only a fragment of the imagination that cannot exist outside my consciousness. Does this mean that mathematics, if it does not exist outside of my mind, and outside of the mind of my kind, is not connected with the outside world? It's funny, but such scholastic sentiments are inherent in anyone who thinks, and this is grandiose. But the fact is that mathematics exists apart from the thoughts of the primate, apart from his will, and different forms of behavior. It exists in the symmetry of the waves of the sea, in the color of tropical fish, in the shape of the moon at the equator and in the north, in the shape of mollusca's shell, in the chair that I'm sitting on, and even in the behavior of girls who take endless selfies for posting on Instagram, and often don't understand that their behavior is stereotyped, described as a mathematical pattern and evolutionary determined. Therefore, if in the foundation of actions of a person or humanity there is some sort of a pattern that can be seen, fixated and described in the language of mathematics, then we can create hypotheses, patterns and mathematical algorithms for digitizing mental images, inner realities and social patterns characteristic for Homo sapiens. Follow my logic. Since we can translate into the language of mathematics the mental images of a person, his behavior, his interaction with his kind, and the surrounding nature, then we can translate the language of numbers into a system of science, a digital code, that in fact will become software for hardware. Why not? This is something that must be done. Because this is not just a dream of any mathematician, theorist or IT engineer. It is a door to a new form of existence of consciousness. 
This will make it possible to emulate in the hardware all those patterns characteristic of a human and even prevent the emergence of artificial intelligence, which suddenly wants to stand up for more than what human created it for. Join us. Become a part of our party. Especially if you have fundamental knowledge in mathematics. If you build models and working artificial intelligence systems. Even if this is not the case, and you earn your living by creating new images, meanings, creative products, use our knowledge as a LEGO constructor, create new objects and new solutions from the constructor. After all, they will have a starting advantage, they will be familiar and original at the same time. Because nothing excites the human brain like dopamine which is released in the brain every time it sees and repeats familiar things and actions. After all, it is just an algorithm that prescribes to save, to not to go anywhere, get fat and multiply, as our predecessors did for the last four million years in a row. Now, welcome to our Quatraland which we present to you as a pencil case with pens, pencils, eraser and ruler as we present the standard set to everyone who goes to the first class for the first time. Welcome to our community of people who value the ability to think and enjoy the realization far more than owning another shiny rattle or boat with unique performance. Because knowledge adds to the human spirit. I just like you, much more like the idea that the fruits of our reflections can transform the world of primitive needs of primates with passports into a new, previously non-existent universe of reason, where everyone who wants it can take their place, who can convert their skills into new meanings. After all of the above, the viewer, like any thinking subject, has a reasonable question. If the author constantly pays attention and refers in his reasoning to the existence of a fractal picture of the world, where micro and macro systems do not just give birth to each other and are symmetrically similar, where is the beginning of this world of thinking systems? Where is that starting point in the countdown of human intelligence, which with or without us will certainly fundamentally change the location and become part of the machine? Why are the principles of organizing energy-intensive intelligent systems, which are both at the level of the cognitum of an individual and at the level of education and structuring of random groups of people, and at the level of collaborations of mathematicians, and when creating intelligent networks based on individual computers are so similar and have common features. In my opinion, this is not an accident. It has a tangible framework and will also reveal unexpected secrets to us. I will take a step aside and pay attention to viruses as a form of life existence. Paradoxically, but having an extremely major life baggage measured in hundreds of RNA nucleotides, evolutionary obtained from ancestors, the virus over and over reproduces the clear logic of aggression and parasitism on the DNA of the host cell. And not just on any type of cell, but it quite consciously chooses their type based on its evolutionary experience. How is the essence of its life cycle hidden in this set of amino acids? And here is another representative, which is often left aside as insignificant, which they begin to study only when it overcomes the boundaries of the biological host and begins to parasitize in humans. We are talking about prions, which on the one hand are a form of life because they reproduce their life cycle and parasite and on the other hand just a set of amino acids. You heard right, it is a form of life from nucleotides. The prion does not even have RNA, but this does not prevent it from fully occupying a place in the pyramid of living beings. It turns out that in order for life to acquire the ability to self-reproduce, 
and adapt to new environmental conditions. It is not at all necessary for the life to be multicellular and have the forms of a living being familiar to us. And then who said that thinking at the level of self-organization should take the form of cognitum, a living creature with a specialized brain? Why do we reject as a form of existence synthetic thinking in a highly organized cell, which has an energy potential hundreds of times greater than any of their relatives, for example muscle tissue cells? Why do we not take into account that energy consumption is always accompanied by either destruction or the emergence and complication of new forms of matter? Why do we not consider the grey silent zones of the DNA of neurons, but we are talking about them, as a biochemical substrate for the synthesis and structuring of information? Just look at the videos that visually show the work of molecular machines in the cells of living beings. Doesn't it remind you of anything? And what I saw surprisingly reminds me of the work of a person in highly developed industrial processes. For example, a conveyor. But it was invented only in 20th century. Perhaps the author is not sufficiently immersed in the topic, and from the point of view of neurophysiologist he is talking nonsense. But where are the works that are devoted to the processes I have indicated in certain types of neurons in the cerebral cortex? Why don't I see works that describe the final substrate for the synthesis of peptides and rare types of RNA in neurons? Why do we pay attention to the relationship between the synthesis of intracellular protein and the external effects of the interaction of neurons with each other, only when we register a spike of individual cells, which merges into the noise of the sea on an electroencephalogram. This approach is very reminiscent of an attempt to study the causes of the aggressive behavior of the crowd outside of the stadium, after the defeat of their favorite team, in isolation from the social status of these individuals, without understanding the reasons why their heads are dominated by the supervalue of the team players and not the value of the labor of people whose windows they beat in the moment of aggression. How can one study the role and significance of individual sociopaths if they are practically invisible in the mass, but thanks to which humanity acquires new forms of knowledge and opportunities for continuous improvement of the quality of life in a global format? The answer is know-how. If there is no system for encouraging and nurturing such individuals in educational institutions, maybe this is another line that a brain researcher passes by when he wants to understand where and when the intellect is born. Let me summarize. If we want to understand where and when intelligence is born in the brain of a modern person, we must not only understand how the synthetic apparatus of the neuron works and what produces, we must study the processes of intracellular synthesis in response to stimulation, at rest and during intracellular interaction, during the formation of the cognitome. If we want to create artificial intelligence, we must understand that its organization is impossible without creating a network based on a machine with primitive synthetic thinking. It is in the self-organization of these machines that the phase transition lies between the ability to beat a champion in chess and the ability to say I think, then I exist.